said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor James. Good morning, church family. Good to see all of you today. I know it's cold outside and foggy and all of that, but uh, we praise God for uh, him drawing us together here today in praise and in worship. And I am also very excited today because the water heater is working. Praise God. Um, Past couple of times it has not been working, and uh, they have been really quick baptisms. Uh, but today, today it's working, and that's good. Um, we celebrate the the ordinance of believers baptism today, and I'm going to invite Nicole Carriger to come and join me here in the baptistry. Nicole came a couple of weeks ago, publicly professing her faith in Jesus Christ before this church and saying, "I want to be baptized." She comes out of a background in Mormonism and has come to faith in Christ, and we uh, rejoice in God's work in her life. So, Nicole, is it your testimony today, your profession of faith, that Jesus Christ is Lord? Yes. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Stay right here. And Nicole and Jason are going to be married soon, I believe. In February, is that correct? Which is like next month. So uh, we're rejoicing for that as well. Let's uh, have prayer together. Jesus, we come before you today thanking you that you did bridge that mighty gulf that we just sang about. At Calvary, your shed blood on the cross... Your resurrection has set us free from sin, has set us free from shame, has set us free from guilt, that we we may walk in grace. For we are proclaiming today, Lord, that which we know is true, that we are rescued, saved by grace through faith and not by ourselves and not by our works. And we've seen a great picture of this today as these baptistry waters have been stirred. That these waters can't save, but you save. And this is a great picture of what has happened in Nicole's heart and in the heart of every believer who has come by faith to Jesus Christ. We proclaim that message and we believe it and we know it's true today. And we thank you, Father, for that message to proclaim. Go with us in this service, we pray, Lord. May it be a blessing to all who are sharing in it here in this sanctuary on television on radio, and around the world through the internet. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Vince, come and welcome Amen. us officially. All right. Amen. God is good, isn't He? Amen. Amen. It is good to see everybody this morning. We thank you for choosing to get up on this, this rainy, cold day. I know I want to stay in bed, especially after our, our weekend we had with our, our youth at Impact. I was, it was a struggle to get out of bed. So we're so thankful you chose to get up. We'd like to welcome you here in the sanctuary. We'd also like to welcome our, our guests that are uh, watching via KIDY or listening on the Cool 100 on the radio station. We, again, thank you for your support as well. If you're a guest with us today in the sanctuary, we have connection cards in the, the seat back in front of you. If you could take one of those, fill it out quickly just so we can make a connection with you. We promise we won't harass you. You can drop that in the offering plate as it goes by later here in the service. We'd very much appreciate it. Amen. You ready to worship some more? Amen. Why don't we stand and greet one another as we continue in worship? All right, so you're, you, you need, I need you to stand so you get ready for your song, okay? I'm just kidding. You don't have to sing a song. <laughs> Some of them were like, oh no. Then you had Emma was like, let's do this, all right? Well, guys, y'all have a good week. How's school going? No, not at all. It's not going? Not for you? Some of y'all. Who was excited to go back to school? Who wasn't excited? What, what about the rest of y'all? What were you? Just not sure? Not sure what school even is right now? Hey, so obviously you guys didn't get the decision to go back to school. Like, that wasn't, that wasn't up to you, right? It was up to the school system, your mom and dad. But you guys get to make a lot of decisions, don't you? Like, what kind of decision? No? 
We might need to talk to your mom and dad about letting you get some decisions in here, all right? <laughs> hey, uh, what's some decisions that you um, have made maybe this morning? Some simple decisions, maybe. You got to decide that you ate cereal. Did you get to pick your cereal? Do you get to pick it out? You don't, but you decided you wanted cereal this morning, right? What about anybody else? I'm sure some of y'all didn't decide to get up, right? You probably got dragging out of bed. All right, what other decisions do we make this morning? Yes, ma'am. You stay, decided to stay in bed a little longer? Good. Uh-huh. I did that. I did that too. What? What you're going to eat? How about, do you guys sometimes get to decide what you're going to wear? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. See, Mary Helen, my wife, she lets me pick out my socks, and I like to wear crazy socks sometimes, so um, the camera didn't get to see that, so I was told not to let the camera see that, so. Uh, But we all make decisions. We make decisions every day, almost every moment there's a lot of times we make decisions. We decide what we're going to say, we decide how we're going to act, right? All right, but also, so there's very simple decisions we make, but also sometimes there's some tougher decisions, aren't there? Sometimes maybe to do the right thing, maybe to, to go to bed when you're told to go to bed instead of staying up, kicking your legs around, making hand motions or whatever you might do. If you have a flashlight, make a little flashlight going around, right? Isn't that right, KP? <laughs> All right, but you know, there, there's, there's easy decisions, there's hard decisions, but there's a lot of decisions we can make. So we're going to talk about decisions and how we are called to make some good ones. We're going to read out of Galatians. Our adults and our, our uh, pastor James is actually going to talk in this book in the new chapter. It's written by the apostle Paul and it says it here in the first verse. Paul says, Paul, an apostle sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the other brothers and sisters with me. It's interesting that Paul started his his letter to the Galatians like this. He says, hey, I am not sent by men or man, but I am sent by God himself. Now, how does that relate to our decisions? Do we make decisions to please people? We, We shouldn't. Sometimes we do. You know, how many people like to go to school and they work hard at school? Everyone raise your hand, though. I'm giving you brownie points with your mom and dads. Raise your hand. There you go. We all like to go to school and, and work hard and, and please our teachers because we want our teachers to be happy for the most part, hopefully. Yes. Come on. <laughs> but in the end, we're not called to please them. We go to school so we can learn new things and new skills, right? But the reality is, but when we please our parents and we honor our parents, just as it says in the Bible, it says, honor your mother and father. Now that is honoring God because God has said to do that. So when we make our decisions, we are called to look at, say, how has God told us to make this decision? How has God led us to help us make that decision? I have some cool bracelets here. These are old. These are back. I think these came out when I was really young. These are called WWJD bracelets. You know what those are, what that stands for? No, not WWE. (laughs) What would Jesus do? So these bracelets came out several, several years ago, and it says, what would Jesus do? And these help to remind us daily, moment by moment, when we make our decisions, small or big, what would Jesus do in this moment? Paul writes that he doesn't do things for man, but he does it for God, who sent his son to die on the cross for us. So that's why we are called to do what Jesus did. So you guys get a special gift here in a second. Once we start going back, you guys get to take one of these with you. Um, And you get to hold on to it. Hopefully this week this will remind you, if you wear it or just put it on your your dresser or whatever, that remind us, just as Paul says, we don't do things just for man. We do it for God, our Heavenly Father. Amen? If I told you my story, you would hear old, oh, but we let it go. And if I told you my story, you would hear love, never gave up. And if I told you my story You would be alive It wasn't mine 
If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sins. Of when justice was served and with mercy wins of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of Him. If I told you my story, you would get me free. If I told you my story, you would hear freedom that was one for me. And if I told you my story, you would hear life overcome the grave. draws me in Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of it This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long yeah, This is my story This is my song have stories of what God has done in our lives and how he has drawn us to him. Nicole has asked me to sing this next hymn this morning because it speaks of her salvation. You know it. I invite you to sing with us. How great thou art. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the words thy hands have made. The stars, I hear the rolling thunder. I pass through all the universe this way. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to me. 
this morning because all that he's done and all that he is, we give him glory. Sing with us. We are a moment, you are forever. Lord of the ages, time before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal. Love everlasting, reigning on time. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was saved. the broken. We are the broken, but you are the healer. You're Jesus Redeemer. You're mighty to save. You are the love song that will sing forever. Bowing before you, blessing your name. We sing holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb who was saved, highest praises, honor, and glory be unto your name. Would you stand with us? Be unto your name. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty. through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. In your pew Bible, that's page 1050, and it's also on the screen. Would you read with me? As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this service, how meaningful it is to us each and every week on this Lord's Day to gather in your name, to praise you, and to set aside all other things and all other priorities and put you right at the top of the list. We pray now that uh, as we express that prioritizing of our time and our talents, we would give back to you what you have given to us. We would give back our tithe. We would give back our time. We would give back our resources out of a sense of awe and worship, giving you the glory, do your name. And we pray, Lord, that we would use, you would use these gifts that we give back to you for the furthering of your kingdom. Lord, bless each and every dollar as it goes into our budget and our cooperative giving. Bless the missionaries that it supports. Bless the schools and the students that you educate using these resources. Bless the evangelism and the cooperative efforts of our state convention uh, for the furthering of your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
job choir. Thank, Thank you for that. that. Uh, Vince, I want one of those WWE bracelets. Uh, that sounds really good. Um, good to see you all today. I know that uh, we have some students and also some uh, sponsors here who uh, <laughs> came in this morning and kind of look like this. Kinda like, they've been through a Disciple Now weekend. And we had about 25, I think, students at that, and uh, we just uh, praise God for that and, and uh, how God has been working. In fact, the, the weather delayed or, or actually canceled one of the programs that they were going to do for recreation yesterday, and so uh, we had over 100 students over in the CLC. That was plan B yesterday, and uh, that's good. That's really good. So we praise God for that. And again, we welcome all of those of you who are joining us today here in the sanctuary on KIDY television, on Cool 100 radio, and uh, on the internet. You've made an important decision today on this Lord's Day to be here and to be present and worshiping. We're grateful for that. The title of the message today is, Is It Still Okay to Be Baptist? Now, you may be here or certainly watching us this morning and uh, you come from a different religious tradition or a different branch of the body of Christ and I want to say up front that this message is not going to be one about how Baptists are better than everybody else. Um... It's not going to be a message about how others of different faiths or practices are uh, nefarious uh, sycophants. Some of you in the grumpy old men breakfast, you hopefully got that. I have heard some sermons in my time that have gone that direction. And uh, frankly, uh, have not done very much for the kingdom of God, in my opinion. In fact, there was a time that uh, Jesus in His ministry was approached by some of His disciples who said, uh, Master, we found a man who was preaching Your Gospel and healing people, and we've never met this man, and he's not a part of us. Tell him to be quiet. And you remember what Jesus said? If he's not against us... He's for us. End of conversation. So, if you come from a different background than being Baptist today, don't, uh, don't tune out the service, okay? There's something in here for everybody. But, indeed, we are a, a unique family of faith that have that title in our name. Hopefully, we are Christian before we are Baptist and not the other way around. But we are Baptist. So the reason I'm preaching on this subject today is not to highlight how good and great Baptist people are. It is to call us in our unique setting to recommit ourselves to preaching the pure, true gospel. That's really where we're headed today. What does it mean for a people in a unique setting like this to preach from the Word of God, the Word of God, the unadulterated Gospel that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, and on the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures and afterwards appeared to many. That's the Gospel. How do we today, in this time and in this place, uniquely as Baptist folk, proclaim that message? That's what we're doing today. So if you have your scripture, you see the the, uh, title there on the slide or in the bulletin. If not, it is Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9. Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9. Paul's words. I am amazed... Astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ 
for a different gospel. Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that, which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. Pretty severe language from the Apostle Paul. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you now, awed by your word. There are some portions of your word, your scripture to us, Lord, where things are vague. We don't hear it very clearly sometimes and have to struggle and investigate. There are others like this one in front of us today that are blunt and easy to understand, but sometimes hard to put into practice. Help us, Lord, to understand and to put it into practice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We live today in a society worldwide that likes upgrades. We are an upgrading society. Doesn't seem like a week goes by, I have a message that pops up on my phone the latest download, the latest operating system version has come out. You need to download that thing. Um, it says so in, in a little more vague words than that, but that's the implication. Download this thing now. Um, we live in an upgrading society. Economists are now telling us that, and I heard this, past, this on the news this past week, an economist was saying we already need to begin to plan for 22nd 22nd century business. New business models and new business practices because technology and upgrades in technology are making many middle class jobs obsolete and will do so continually into the future. Just a few weeks ago, Shannon and I made a very important purchase We uh, finally got enough in our piggy bank to go over to the store and buy a uh, new upgrade, a new television, HD, wireless technology. This is an upgrade from our 14-year-old analog, bulky uh, Sanyo. Good brand, by the way. It lasted 14 years. Pretty good. But we uh, had this conversation this past week because we, uh, <laughs> we feel kind of uh, behind the times, kind of old. In fact, our parents, Shannon's parents, upgraded to new iPhones, the iPhone 7. Uh, and they have done this before we have. We are hanging on to our iPhones. She has a 4 and I have a 5 until they absolutely die. Right? We're that kind of folk. But I, we, we, we turned to each other this week because the, her parents were saying how great these upgrades were. And we thought, our parents have beat us <laughs> to this technology. Who are we? You know, who are we? We're constantly upgrading. I heard on the BBC News this week that China is now developing technology for jet pack commuting systems. Jet packs. No more need for trains and cars. Can you imagine? In just a few years, we could have jet pack parking at First Baptist Church. <laughs> My goodness. It could happen. It, we laugh, but somebody 50, 100 years from now maybe listen to this sermon and thinking they were way behind the times. We may look like we're driving horse-drawn carriages to them. 
But, let me say this. Not every upgrade is worth downloading. Some of them contain viruses that will certainly corrupt and perhaps take down your system. This was the situation among the Galatian people. Some people had come into their midst after Paul had proclaimed the true Gospel. And they said, uh, folks, what Paul said was half right, but we have Gospel version 2.0. You need to upgrade. And it was flashy. And it sounded good. And all the philosophers and all the right preachers of the day proclaimed this Gospel 2.0. And they said, this is the New Gospel. Paul said, wait a minute. The more I examine this new upgrade, the more I find that it's sick. It has a virus. It is a Gospel of works. It is a Gospel of humanism. It is not a Gospel of grace. And he says, I am astonished. Galatian people, San Angelo people, I am astonished that you have bought into this. That being said, is it still okay to be Baptist? Yes, as long as the Gospel is at the heart of what we do. Not 2.0, but the Gospel. Is it okay to make some upgrades and changes over time? You bet, as long as it is Gospel. As long as it is Gospel. You see, friends, it really boils down to this. There are some characteristics of a Baptist church, I think, these days, and we see it even at the church in Galatia, some characteristics that Paul wants us to get, wants them to get, wants us to get. To be a church that stays true to the Gospel, but knows when and where and how to make the right kinds of upgrades. And I felt very impressed recently to bring these characteristics to us as great reminders, especially in this new year, about how we can stay very gospel-oriented and committed. And those who are listening, perhaps outside of the Baptist tradition, these are almost universal. You can be a good Methodist, a good Presbyterian, a good Church of Christ, as it, even paying attention to these kinds of characteristics as well. But what, how do we determine and discern when an upgrade, when a risk, when a challenge is truly gospel-centered and truly worth it in our lives? few characteristics that come to the fore here. Here's number one. Characteristic number one. A gospel-oriented Baptist church and, and Christian realizes that everyone must individually give an account of themselves to God. No one is immune from that. No group can be accountable for you. In other words, are we striving with whatever we do and whatever we say Is it to please people or is it to please God? Is it to proclaim our gospel or is it God's gospel? Are we trying to build our kingdom or are we working on the kingdom of God? In other words, Paul said, I am astonished how quickly you are 
going for the bad upgrade. It was not a gospel centered on grace. They are answerable to God for that. In fact, Paul said many of them deserted their own church. The Greek word means they transferred themselves in a rebellious and quick way. They just up and left for the upgrade. It's the same word here, the word desert, that Paul uses of a child that does exactly opposite of what the parent instructs the child to do for good. Have you ever had a child like that? Don't touch the hot stove. What does the child do? Zap off to the emergency room. You know, that is the picture that Paul is using here. They went to another gospel. A different Jesus. Which Paul says, you know, if you really think about it, he catch, it kind of catches himself midstream. He says, if you think about it, that's really not a different gospel at all. They said, you can be saved, but you have to practice all of these food laws. You can be saved, but you have to be circumcised. You can be saved, but you have to have the right clothes. You can be uh, saved, but you have to be in this level of, uh, uh, of distinguish, uh, uh, distinctiveness. You can be saved, but you have to be in the right socioeconomic bracket. You uh, can be saved, but your church has to do exactly like this. You have to fit this mold and this model and have this kind of, of worship service. You have to read this book and listen to this kind of preacher. My goodness, that is a gospel of works. It's not the gospel of grace. My friends, we are accountable to God for how we respond individually and as a church to the gifts and the resources and the manpower that He's given us to use for good for the gospel. The true gospel. Not just an upgrade. Friends, we're accountable. We're accountable to our Sunday school classes. Amen? We're account- God's given those to us. Great teachers. We're accountable for that. We're accountable for our worship. It is not necessarily a good thing to come into this place on a Sunday morning looking to be critical, looking to be negative. In fact, I would encourage you, come into this place on Sunday morning ready to worship. God, where are you at work? I may not necessarily like one of the songs, but God, I can see the words up there. Speak to me through those words. God, what does this baptism mean for me today? Do I need to be baptized? What does that picture communicate? Pastor, uh, or or God, I may not, uh, I may not even like uh, Bill too much. Now, who would say that in our church, by the way? You know, or the pastor or something. But, but this is the word of God being proclaimed. God, prepare my heart to hear the word and hear the message and respond. Don't abandon the call of God of accountability for a bad upgrade. Look for the simple true gospel. We are accountable. We are accountable to others. I've said it before, I've said it again. Vince says it a lot now too. I'm glad for that. We are a better church when you are here and participating and involved. Getting center on the gospel, centered on the gospel. Number two, second characteristic. Second characteristic of a gospel-centered Baptist church. There is no ruler except for Jesus Christ of the church. No ruler. We Baptists, we uh, now I, I'm going to speak Baptist language for just a moment. Okay. We have no hierarchy. We have no bishop. We have no pope. Some traditions do it that way and read the Bible that way. We simply do not. We see Jesus Christ as our only mediator between us and God. I am not a priest. I'm a pastor. I'm a leader. There are leaders of the church, but there's no hierarchy. Some churches have elders. We do not. We have deacons who serve, not who run the church. We are accountable 
to God. See, watch out. Paul said that there were folks who came in who were called disturbers of the church. Friends, this is why it is important for you to get into a Bible study class, to get accountable to somebody at the local church level. The Bible is our authority for faith and practice. It is our measuring stick for how we live life. We don't want anyone, no matter how popular or how uh, slick, to be a disturber and take us away from the biblical message of the Gospel. There's nothing more dangerous and disturbing in a church today for someone to get up and say, I've got it all figured out. This is how to live your life. This is how you can have your best life now. That disturbs the body of Christ. It's got to be gospel oriented. This is why John the Apostle said, test the spirits. Do you remember that? Test the spirit. Ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Fully man, fully divine. Do you believe in grace? Salvation by grace through faith and not by works. And if the Spirit says, I can't handle that, you know you're dealing with something false. Test the spirits. That is characteristic of a gospel-centered church. Third characteristic. Encourage others to hear and proclaim the Gospel message. There is no need, my friends, to be squeamish and protective of the Gospel. Nothing can encourage us more than when we are together proclaiming truth and studying it and struggling with it even. You don't, if you come to church here or hopefully somewhere else and and you get involved in a Bible study, hopefully there is a struggle happening. Not in terms of conflict, but a struggle with the text. What does this mean? If there's no struggle, sometimes there's no studying going on. (laughs) We are not called to... Bobby Dagnall up in Lubbock, I love what he says, we're not called to sit, soak, and sour. We're called to study and struggle. In fact, uh, are you are you doing that? Are you doing that in your Sunday school class? Are you struggling with the text? Are you walking alongside someone who's struggling with life? How many of you have been affected when you knew that people in this church body were praying for you as you went through a struggle? Oh my goodness, friends! I love it when I hear that from somebody that I'm extending pastoral care to. They say, Pastor, I can feel the prayers. I know people are praying for me. Struggle together. Struggle together. You know, uh, Bill and Vince and I meet weekly for staff meeting and strategy and that sort of thing. We've kind of come up with a saying recently uh, since Christmas and... uh, It's sort of blunt, but I want to give it to you so you can hear it. The saying is this, the train is leaving the station. That's that's kind of our guiding philosophy right now. That means that we're we're committed to leading gospel-oriented proclamation and, and ministry. And friends, we hope that you jump on board that train. We, we, we can't stay in the station for too long. Now is a good time, by the way, to uh, in this new year, to decide whether or not you are all in when it comes to a local church family. That's what Paul is suggesting to them. I want you to be all in. And my goodness, I, I've pastored for over 10 years now. I've been in ministry over 19 which is really weird to think about. And I've heard a lot from people 
Well, let's just call it what it is. Excuses for not getting active and involved in loving one another and struggling with the Bible and reading that together and proclaiming the Word of God and and struggling with that. And those excuses hurt us. In fact, some, some have told me this is probably the most popular over the years. Pastor, the Lord's or Sunday, Sunday is my family time. That's fine. I'm glad it is. But this is your church family too. The family needs your time. If we cannot commit to our biological family and our spiritual family, we are too busy. We are too busy. We are the people of God. If something other than the Gospel demands your time on the Lord's day, experiment with something for me. Deny it. Think about what would happen in this church. I heard a great uh, brother in the faith uh, at another church in town proclaim this very thing last week. And I thought, man, my goodness, God's moving. We've got two pastors saying the same thing in San Angelo, Texas. Wonderful. He said, next time you have a a big commitment come up, like on a a Sunday uh, that takes away from your worship, tell the coach no. Tell tell the person no. And if enough Christians begin to do that and say, I'm worshiping the Lord today, it's the Lord's day, what will happen? Those activities will just cease. Shannon and I heard a heard a uh, report on the Weather Channel of all places this morning. You know, there's some kind of bad weather up in Missouri. And the person was reporting, and of course the traffic behind him is just zooming along, you know. It's 33 here, there may be ice, but you know, they look around and all the cars are just flying down the freeway. There's no ice. He said, you know, I've gotten some reports that some local churches are shutting down today, but there is some good news. The St. Louis Cardinals Winter Conference is on his schedule and we're expecting a packed house. That is a testimony against the church. Do we want to go for that upgrade or not? Some may respond, well, Pastor, you're being legalistic about all this. I don't think so. Legalism is saying, God doesn't love you if you don't come to church. Legalism is giving favors to people who look a certain way in the church family, or give the most in the offering plate. This is not legalism, friends. I, as your pastor, I want you in the flock. Paul wanted them in the flock. Don't stray after Gospel 2.0. Discern that. In fact, I, I, and this is probably the the one that has gotten me the most over the years. Pastor, I, I, I'm just going to be a part of the church when I feel like it. I'll be here when I feel like it. I, I worship when I, when I feel like it, when God leads me. I, I'll be there when I feel like it. And you know what? I've thought a lot about that. And here's my response. Praise God. The people who led me to Christ didn't think that way. Praise God that the people who started this church under an oak tree in, in 1883 didn't think that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. Not every upgrade is worth downloading. One more and I'll be done. I know I'm already over time. But one more thing. Cooperation is the fourth characteristic. Paul is encouraging these Galatians, let's stay together and cooperate. Many of you have heard me over the past few months and even years talk about 
cooperation even outside of these walls, not only inside it, but, but outside of it. I met with two wonderful other pastors in town, John Pope and, and another pastor yesterday for breakfast. They pastor two African-American congregations here in town. The, the third uh, pastor couldn't be with us. He was stuck in Dallas because of weather. But next month, we're going to call some people in our churches together to meet and begin to discuss plans for how we can eat together and fellowship together and worship together. We're going to try to break these walls down. I thought, what a better day than today on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend to say, church, we have got to cooperate. No matter our skin color and racial background and all that, the the walls that the world puts puts up in front of us. Is it still okay to be Baptist? You bet. You bet. As long as the gospel is front and center. Is it okay to upgrade? Is it okay to take risk? Is it okay to encourage one another to take risk and experiment and do things differently than perhaps we've ever done them before? Absolutely, yes. As long as the gospel is front and center. That's the message from Galatians chapter 1. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the baptism today, the prayer today, the worship today, the giving today. And Lord, for this word from Galatians, where Paul uh, didn't beat around the bush, but let us know strong churches cooperate. Strong churches proclaim the gospel. Strong Christians encourage one another and struggle with one another and walk alongside one another in the ups and downs. And everyone is accountable to God. For you have given us a great gift, the gift of grace that we don't attain through our works, through our family, through our background, through our money, but only by surrendering ourselves to you. By grace, we're saved through faith. And I pray, Lord, that if anyone is hearing this message today and resonates with it and the Spirit says, you need to be saved today, rescued from you, rescued from your sin, rescued from your past, rescued from your biases, rescued from your egotism, rescued that today would be the day they would come and say, Lord, I surrender all. I surrender my life to you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, not on the things that I attain or do, but on you. Lord, I pray that today would be a day that we would recommit ourselves to that gospel and that proclamation and ourselves. We'd recommit ourselves to the importance of the local church and our family that we have here. That we'd be together and worship together and pray together and fellowship together and struggle alongside one another together as we journey on this great race of faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name.